microphone test. Hello. Can everyone hear me? Am I appallingly loud or not loud enough? Okay. Attention in the back and in the front and everywhere in between. Hello. Is everyone here? Are you here? We don't know. Good. Okay, good. It's hard to tell sometimes. Uh, my name is Nick. Hello. I work for Abbott Bookshop. Uh, we are delighted to have you here. Um, if you have ever been to Danielewski's forums, my name is Splendor there, and I would be delighted to talk with you if you uh, have met me. Um, or not. Uh, we are so glad to have Mark Danielewski here. Um, we have a couple of things to say first. Uh, we would like to thank Stan Mullins, the wonderful and beautiful artist, for letting us use his space. Thank you, Stan. We appreciate it very much. This is a wonderful, wonderful location. It was my dream that we would have this event here, and my dream came true. Um, we would also like to thank the Pulaski Heights Barbecue uh, across the street. If you need to, thank you, yes, thank you. They probably can't hear you from there. Um, but if you need to use the restroom or get delightful barbecue, uh, you should just walk across the street to the diagonal on the right and uh, go over there. There's no facility here for restrooms, but there it is. We would also like to mention briefly that uh, Avid Bookshop is an independently owned and local bookshop. We are able to have events like this because we have incredible, awesome customers like you uh, who shop with us and uh, let us live our dreams, uh, and we appreciate you very much. And if you have not bought a copy of any of Mark's books, we have plenty over there. Um, they're all awesome. They are among my favorite books of all time. And uh, we appreciate it. We'll also have them, obviously, at the bookshop, which you should stop by if you've never been. Great. Uh, that's all. Thank you so much. And please welcome Mark Z. Danielewski. to Georgia, you shouldn't underdress. So here I am, overdressed. So I'm gonna read, I'm gonna read a few a few passages, but the very beginning, I, I have to let you in on, on something that I know that House of Weeds has uh, has caused a few nightmares and so during the course of its existence. Uh, but I have to say, the familiar for me is becoming a, a very strange experience. I mean, we're in the middle of a drought in Los Angeles, and just as I was finishing this book and shipping volume two to my publisher on a tiny little hard drive that held so much of my life, the sky cracked open, and there was this enormous rainstorm, and the streets were, were like rivers. And, here I am thinking about volume three, and I was sketching some scenes, and some of this was even in volume two, and I arrive here, and this is the place. It's this farm, and it was so bizarre to see, and I actually had to go around and take a, take a few pictures. So I feel in many ways the familiar has brought me here, so um, we'll see what comes to uh, does anyone have a copy of House of Leaves? Why? I could, uh, <laughs> 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 I thought I'd start at one beginning. Sometimes I recognize these beginnings. So I don't recognize them, but I began to think about how I was going to do this and remember this. So I thought I would, I would start here. And this was also written a long, this was er written early in the life of the House of Leaves, too. The panther paces. Waiting reminds him that clarity is painful, but his pain is unbeatable. Obscure, Kiraskou road to their human senses. In time, they will misread his gait, his moon mad. The almost gentle way his tail caresses the bars. In time, they will mistake him for something else, without history, without the shadow of being, a creature 
without repentance of living. They will read only his name. They will be unable to perceive what strangeness lies beneath his patience. Patience is the darkest side of power. He is dark. He is black. He is exquisitely powerful. He has made pain his lover and hidden her completely. Now he will never forget. She will give birth to memories they believe he has been broken of. He smells the new rain, tastes its change. His claw skates along the cold floor. Love curled up and died on such a floor. He blinks. Clarity improves. He hears other creatures scream and fade, but silence is his. He knows. In time, the gates will open. In time, his heart will open. Then the shadows will bleed. plunge into this thing. <laughs> so it makes sense, I think, at least to me, that uh, we are at the very beginning of things. We should start at the tail end of things. Not 1984, not 2001, but billions and billions and trillions of years into the future, when time itself is about to unravel. It's also new this season, in this television world that we may or may not be entering. Our common horrors, astral omega. One by one, our skies go black. Stars are extinguished, collapsing into distances too great to breach. Soon, not even the memory of light will survive. Long ago, our manifold universes discovered futures would only expand. No arms of limit could hold or draw them back. Short of the miracle, they would continue to stretch, untangle, and vanish, abandoned at long last to an unwitnessed dissolution. That dissolution is now. Final winks slipping over the horizon share what needs no sharing. There are no miracles. We might say that just to survive to such an end is a miracle in itself. We would agree. But we are not everyone. Even if you could imagine yourself billions of years hence, you would not begin to comprehend who we became or what we achieved. Yet left as you are, you will no more tremble before us than a butterfly on a windless day trembles before colluding skies, still calculating beyond one of your Pacific horizons. Once we could move skies, we could transform them, we could make them sink. And when we fell into dreams, our dreams asked questions, and our sky, still singing, answered back. You are all we once were, but the vastness of our strangeness exceeds all the light years between our times. The frailty of your senses can no more recognize our reach than your thoughts can entertain even the vaguest outline of our knowledge. In ratios of quantity, a pulse of what we comprehend renders meaningless your entire history discovered. We are on the other side of history, yours just beginning, ours approaching a trillion years of ends. Yet even so, we still share a dyad of commonality. Two questions endure, both without solution, what haunts us now and will always hunt you. The first reveals how the promise of all our postponements, ever longer, ever more secure, what we eventually mistook as immortality was from the start a broken promise. Entropy suffers no reversals. Even now, here on the edge of time's end, where so many continue to vanish, we still have not pierced that veil of sentience undone. The first of our common horrors, death. Yet we believe and accept that there is grace and finally truth in standing accountable before such an invincible unknown. But we are not everyone. Death, it turns out, is the mother of all conflicts. There are some who reject such an outcome. There are some who will still fight for an alternate future, no matter the cost. Here, then, is the second of our common horrors, 
what not even all of time will end, what plagues us now, and what will always plague you, war. And now we're just going to plop down in the middle. I marked my, uh, my page with a, a picture that someone gave me of their cat in Boston. This, <laughs> this is Mo, and Mo's going to be with me for this trip here. So thank you, Mo. And by the way, I, the, the next passage I'm going to read is about, it's like, it goes about 15 minutes or so. So it might be more comfortable to sit down. I'm be really adamant about standing. <laughs> Now I'm above you. <laughs> All right. Are you comfortable? Can everyone hear me? Dr. Potts never made Xanther feel punished. And eventually, the consequences of this really sank in. Xanther getting the drift that these were her 50 minutes, and she could trust him for the most part, even if she had no idea why the most part, or even what the not most part was, parts which made no difference if she got right to it, like she did today, following early advice by Dr. Potts. Try telling me first the thing that is most difficult to tell. I will help you. Or, if not that, then ask me the question that is most difficult to ask and I will help you. So Xanther went right to the raindrops. The number that said there was a number, even as it hit a number that was no number, and how it had made her feel. She even explained how her friend Clay is a brother named Phineas who is brilliant but fears dolphins. Or not the dolphins, but how many dolphins there are because his fear is also about the counting because when you see three dolphins playing in the waves, that means there are really like nine with the rest under the waves. But if you see like a lot, like 27, there are really like 243. And that's just when you're talking about dolphins. What if you're talking about bad things, like counting crimes? And then your mind really heats up and keeps heating up until it might just turn into sticky, smelly smoke. Xanther also told Dr. Potts, and this part was really difficult, how Clay thought his brother was crazy and needed to get back in the hospital again. Phineas had already tried to kill himself twice. Like Xanther, he's left-handed. Clay's called him schizo. Actually, more than that, Phineas can solve a Rubik's Cube in under five minutes. Do you think you're crazy? Xanther can't solve even one side in 50 minutes. White's still patched with red, yellow, and green. Do you think you had a seizure on the way over here? I thought I did, or I was about to. Did you tell your dad? No. Along with the question song, seizures is the other thing she and Dr. Potts talk about a lot. Even if Xanther would prefer not to. Since December, she's been seizure-free. No pills either, just the new diet, ketogenic. Xanther doesn't mention how she always sees a brass key clutched between her toes, but she does describe her hunger. Thirst, too. I can eat a lot, and I know I'm full, like I can see what was just on my plate, but I still feel so craving and thirsty. I, I drink water, but like the water doesn't seem to answer the thirst. Does that make sense? Even during this session, while replacing by a flip and a right double twist, one yellow tile with another white tile, the subject comes up. Dad, too, was so sweet. At square one, I could see he wanted the French toast. I told him that I didn't mind, and like I really didn't. But he still had what I had. Why the frown? I'm getting some big surprise this afternoon. I'm not even excited. Because your parents do so much for you already? Panther nods. Like these visits here? Yup. And visits with other doctors too. Even my food and please, it's not like I'm a total idiot, right? I know it costs money. And even though dad seems pretty happy, especially today, or well, okay, not happy, happy, but really relieved, are they the same thing? Sorry, because like he's supposedly getting some money, a lot of money. I overheard this. Sorry. I, I worry a lot about Frey and Shast. Like, they're, you know, getting the short end of the stick. Dr. Potts smiles. What? You have epilepsy, and they're getting the short end of the stick? Do you want to explain that, that math to me? Xanther gets rid of a green tile, only to find two more red tiles messing up her white side. 
Cogsworth once said he solved the whole thing in under five minutes. I just pulled all the little plastic pieces apart and put it back together. Cox is the real genius. Probably because she doesn't know what to say and because they just have a little more time left. Xanther thinks about the most, most difficult thing to tell. What's going on with, with parcel thoughts, that app, and the horror sphere. But instead explains all about the phone calls and the emails less parents are screaming about. I don't know, it was my, my dad's friend Mephisto, Mephisto, big fro, super genius, or just super crazy. I think he babysat me once. For some reason he decided to use my parents' info as contact info for this big ad campaign with promises of like huge Costco discounts and even cash. And the phones haven't stopped ringing. Supposedly a prank. I guess I don't understand what a prank means. Isn't there supposed to be a laugh at the end of a prank? In theory. Yesterday I tried to tell mom how all these calls are kind of like an attack. You know, like so much coming in, you're paralyzed. Except at home, the lights stay on. In December, the lights went out. Oh yeah. Santa hates talking about the funeral. Just thinking about it makes her tingle. Want to gas. She can even start believing it's happening all over again that that bad Xantha ended up in the hospital. Sometimes I think thinking the wrong thing brings on, you know, a seizure. Xantha nods. She's never gotten used to saying it like it's freaking Voldemort. Except so much worse than Voldemort. Voldemort, there, she said it. Excuse me? Uh, Dr. Potts, do you ever think like there's a conversation going on, you know, like somewhere out there, somehow parallel to the one you're having with yourself, like in your head, or even with someone else? How do you mean? I'm like, there are these voices that know everything so close. Like voices that don't really live and can't die and have been around forever. Such a noisy, boisterous parade. Before the start of things, it will even be around after the end of things. She has no idea. You know, privileged with all that's like, that's that, that, like Google, only true. <laughs> Xanther stops flipping the Rubik's Cube. Tears wet both her cheeks. I really miss him. I'm glad to hear that. Like, even when I'm not thinking about him, I think I am thinking about him. And I know I didn't even know him that well. Dr. Potts hands her a box of tissues. If I could grant you one certainty, Xantha, one which you could hold on to without dissolving under all your scrutiny, let it be just how remarkable a young girl you are. Now, why do I feel like such a disappointment? Like, I'm disappointing him all the time. Frady K, that's what he called me. Dove was so brave. And I can't even be at his funeral without <sighs> Sometimes I feel so ashamed. Actually, all the time. Xanther, how do you imagine brave Dr. Potts suddenly asks, moving slightly forward in his chair too, head up, almost rigid? Fearless? I mean, like, I don't want to feel like, like so jittery all the time. Is that all you want? Xanther stops fiddling with the Rubik's Cube. Think big, young lady. And for a moment, she's all dove, or wants to be like dove. Not all over the place and over inquisitive, but clear and sure and gentle and true. But you don't need years and years to hear, or a bed full of books to understand, or all, all the scars of a lifetime to value. Something so small and light, it practically sits in your palm. What Xanther could share, what would bring comfort, and in times of fear, could bring calm. Isn't not jittery like a good start? And Xanther says instead, back to the Rubik's Cube. What's happening in school, Dr. Potts asks then, relaxing back into his chair, but not quite relaxing, alert still to something Xanther can't quite follow. Any predators, I mean preds? This new direction is a mystery, but Xanther appreciates Dr. Potts' use of her vocabulary. He already knows how many of the family's moves were because of bullying. Sometimes physical, with one particularly bruising encounter, small bones fractured, which less parents still can't believe was nothing, even though Xanther swears it was nothing. Nothing compared to a full-on attack. 
like in Alexandria, with all of Dove's comrades in uniform, saying if Xanther needs anything, anything at all, they would do it, even if that meant marching into hell itself, which Xanther doesn't believe in. And then all of them standing by helpless, as Xanther began slamming into the coffin, forearms first, then her head, until a ground heavier than any coffin started hitting her too. Nothing any get, gun could prevent, only stop. Xanther kind of wishes one of those holstered guns would have made her stop for good. Her parents, though, didn't stand by helpless. They knew what to do. It didn't involve guns. Though when Xanther got out of the hospital, she looked like someone had pistol whipped her. No school beatings will ever come close to that. And anyway, the school beatings part is pretty rare. Preds are at their worst when they get other kids to wall up, start calling her names, calling her weird, finally just looking through or whispering through her as if whispers and her were never there to begin with. Which generally doesn't happen until she gets afflicted. As one kid once hissed, where was that? Georgia? Some teachers tried to step in, but that made it worse. Because no teacher is going to be her friend, and no kid is going to be the friend of a kid who only has teachers for friends who aren't even friends. Probably because of Dove, something he'd said, what exactly she can no longer trace, Xanther has never given up the names of her assailants. Even to Dove, who one time had gotten out his gun. Though also because of Dove, which Xanther can trace, him telling her, always speak out your situation, Xanther has never hidden from her parents when the Preds have found her again. Fortunately, Thomas Star King, or Karma's Torn Sight, as Clay calls it, isn't so bad. Xander senses something cruel there, but not triumphant. Already she's made some friends. She's even confided them, in them about her condition, and they seem cool with it and able to keep her confidence. No rumors run the school campus yet. Of course, none, none of her homies have seen a seizure though they all seemed pretty shocked by the aftermath marked out on her face at the start of this year. That was two weeks after the fact, and her face had gotten the least of it. Elbows and shins could keep hidden. Clay said to tell everyone she tried to catch a Christmas tree, which beat wiping out on a razor, which she'd done plenty of times, or a runyon, hello the latest scabs on her knees, because isn't catching a Christmas tree so ridiculous it's not a lie? which she never needed to tell anyway because no one at school asked her what happened. Xanther tracks a white tile around the five sides, flip twist, flips on flips, bringing it to rest among its white kind with only a red and green remaining. Preds don't see me there, Xanther speaks up. I'm invisible to them, to most kids actually, though there is this one kid, like grown up big, no way he's 12 or even 13, Dendish Mauer. Scary, for reals. Smokes, chews when he's not smoking, supposedly sells Molly, fizzing all the time, his crew's like, his crew's like Preds for sure. More twists to flips, a green tile's turn, a second to last white to track. He started picking on my friend Byer. Nothing too bad, just jabs, saying mean little things, some threats, not too loud, mostly like he's teasing. Byer tries to ignore it, but I can see it makes him sick. He and Dendish ride the same bus, which is the perfect place to bring up probably today's most difficult thing to tell, her phone. Well, not the phone itself, pink and rad, average number of texts. It's not like Mephisto put Xanther's number out there. Anwar would have gone dub mad if Mephisto had gone that far. Asteri even worse. No, this is about the horror sphere. Mayumi already warned her this morning. They all did in text. Mayumi. Most said he's got it, Cogs. Bye bye got it the worst, Byer. Bye bye's cool like a jewel, Clay. DGAF burn their lives down, Josh. IMHO, I look better. Some creepy app called Mute All Hate. Emoji makes it way harder for the adults to catch on, Clay claims. And with good reason, the app's way sicker than Ugly Booth or Zombie Booth does with pixels what knives and rusty can openers could do to your face. Dove, I know, would do something. He'd stand up for his friend, and I know I should for Bayer, but I don't know how. Dendish comes near, and I mean, like, I even see him down the hall, and I freeze. Talk about Freddy K. Xanther can't even look at some pictures on her phone. You're not going to tell this parents, should I? 
Dove could look at anything in the eye. I can't. Not even my friends, my parents, not even you. As if to prove it too, Xanther tries to focus on Dr. Potts' eyes. Keep there for what, a second? And though she finds nothing but warmth, she doesn't lax, not even a second, because like, what's he looking at and how at her? And with her looking at him too, probably understanding something she's thinking without her understanding what she's thinking. And no question, it's something like she'll have to do something about, right? Especially if she keeps this up, this looking at it, right? Something she won't be, know how to respond to or defend or answer. The edges of the room darkening, temperatures dropping, and all because of two concentric rings of blue, tiny two, surrounding an even tinier dot, black dot. Before Xanther skitters helplessly off to the bridge of Dr. Potts' nose, to his beard, all the salt and pepper hair around his lips, retreating even further to relief, blind, unthinking, and certainly questionless, the last tile twisting into place, at least, as Xanther whispers, defeated. See, Dr. Potts smiles at her victory. A mess of color on five sides, but with the sixth, all white. Progress, well done. Now tell me one last thing, whatever comes to mind, as we only have a minute left. Dr. Potts often says this. Xanther figures it's a time's up technique, but does he do it with all his patients or just Xanther? Not that she objects, she'd hate to impose on him, let alone on Anwar waiting for her outside, taking extra time, that would mortify her. Did his light flash before his eyes? What? Dr. Potts looks caught off guard, even a little bewildered. Who? Before he died, Dove, you know, did like his life really flash before his eyes? Oh. What? That's not what you said. I didn't. Did his love flash before his eyes? That's what I said? Dr. Potts nods. Are you sure? Yes. And I'm sure it did. Thank you. So any questions? <coughs> I think there was a cup of water. I have a question. That, right. there, behind you. And behind you. There. I know, the question you're all wanting to ask. Yes, I am a feminist. <laughs> <laughs> yes. Um, kind of a two-part question. Um, you have so many distinct voices in the writing, uh, it, and it seems so well defined. And I'm wondering if you had, or what what your process is for defining those when you're writing them, and if any of them give you particular difficulty. Um, and sort of the second part is. Did everyone hear the question? Yes? Um, gosh. The question of voice, such a, such a great one. It kind of haunted me for a long time. I remember I was um, being interviewed by Malcolm Jones of Newsweek for House of Leaves, and it was one of those old school interviews, which means it was great. He flew out to LA, and we spent two days just talking and he distilled all of that down to 500 words. And unfortunately, a lot of what we talked about wasn't in his view, but we did stumble onto this question of whether image has voice, you know? Can we look at a, at a de Kooning or a Pollock or a Damien Hirst and see voice, you know? Does Georgia O'Keeffe's work speak to us? And of course, in some ways it does. And it creates an even more marvelous voice when all the authors are, are, when all these painters are sort of speaking together over time. And yet, it's so impossible to vocalize. But maybe today's, you know, technological innovations are allowing us, in a way, to peer in at that voice, even though sometimes it's on mute, whether it's, you know, on Tumblr or, or Instagram. And so for me, there's always been this thing about recognizing that voice is the voice beyond what we typically understand as a voice. And it's always been about um, looking almost at the quantum level of our, of our 
not even our syllables or our letters, but even the impulses behind wanting to form a little unit. This is so beautiful. Trains coming through. We're off the tracks. Oh no, we're on the tracks. <laughs> um, and that's part of the voice, right? It's 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 this sound, this rumbling. Whether it's it's a it's an actual figure of technology, you know, it's an announcement of arrival. <laughs> Zampano has a very specific voice. Johnny Truant has a voice. Pelopina has a voice. Sam and Haley's voices in, in Only Revolutions are made up of, of the vernacular of teenagers over the course of 200 years. Um, and in the 50 Year Sword, we recognize that a story that we could read with one voice may be comprised of many, many voices. So even if you're willing to look at yourself through the course of the day, you're going to start to realize that a lot of phrases that you speak are actually the phrases of a parent or a peer or that, were, that came from a certain book, and that we've slowly kind of mashed them together and called it our own, even though all of these kind of constructions are hardly not our own. So who is the voice that speaks through us? And that's always the question. And for me, one of the ways of hearing that voice, because we do have a sense that there's something common there, there's something familiar, is beginning to access a, a wide range of voices. So, in the literary boxing ring, probably, you know, my biggest bout is, is with the monolithic voice. Because one of the comforts of a monolithic voice, whether it's, it's a sacred text or, you know, a powerful, you know, writer, whether it's Homer or Virginia Woolf or Pynchon or, 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 or others, is that they give you this compelling sound to organize the world and you feel like in that moment that the world makes sense. And it is one of the great gifts of literature. It is one of the great gifts of great texts because it kind of placates you and says, ah, it can be arranged, it can be ordered, we can sing the song of our times, of our place, and find peace. But that's really not how it works, you know? What works is that there's a train rumbling by and there's a cacophony of different languages that we can't quite here, and sometimes we just become deaf to, you know? We, we are so good at finding patterns that are familiar and that are our own that we have become completely blind to the dialogue that's going on. I mean, even in this space, think of the mute dialogue that's going on between these paintings and sculpture. I mean, there's a whole dialogue of material and color that's surrounding us, but right now we're all tuned to a certain grammar and a certain language. So for me, it's, it's about embracing the strangeness, embracing that which is outside of me. And part of it is craft, you know, part of it is instinct, you know, that comes from just doing this for decade after decade. And another is going to Singapore, talking to East LA gang members, you know, sitting in those actual interrogation rooms in Rampart Station in Los Angeles and talking with detectives, you know. And beginning to acquire and learn those songs and hear how they sound, you know, and um, and so you know, so through that craft, then the the larger aim is then to begin to awaken this kind of strange symphony that we are in the middle of. That might be a nice title for tonight: the strange symphony. You know, maybe not. I don't know. 
You had another part to your question, I think, that I didn't answer. Yeah, I think um, you know technology's always been interested, interesting to me, and and certainly how it's part of this conversation, and how it's kind of another kind of another net, if you will, that, that can capture more aspects, um, is you know is 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 of interest to me, and I think it's it's part of the dialogue. But I think also technology, in particular, and voice, is. Especially significant because the because the familiar really at its heart is concerned with how we place in the world that which not only doesn't have a voice but will never have a voice. You know, how do we situate this planetarity that we you know live in? How do we situate the trees and the animals? And you know, one of the great excuses is that well, they don't speak like us. If they had a language, then you know they would have a right to vote and they would become part of the system. But we who are who who have a voice um, can often use that voice to deafen our awareness of that which is without a voice and yet so pertinent to who we are, so so germane to who we are. So that at least is the exploration, the beginning of this journey, so to speak. That's the shortest answer I get. <laughs> yes. Um. Never what? Never spoke to you. Right. Douglas Hofstadter never heard of your book prior right. to my asking him whether he was ever actually contacted Oh, uh, he just forgot. <laughs> <laughs> Well, you know the answer I'm going to give, and you're going to hate it. Yeah. It was this trunk, and it was filled with papers. <laughs> <laughs> I just did my best to put it together. And I don't know, Borges, I don't know, Hofstetter, I don't know who those cats are, but I just, like, they sound cool to me, and I'll put them in there, because, you know, that's what it's going to be. Um, I, I will say that, you know, the... The great thing about being a novelist is that it always starts with this isn't true. You know, one of one of the, the, the lines that I loathe when I see a movie or a book is based on a true story. You know, <laughs> if you got it, you don't need to say that. You know, the whole point is we're gonna start with nothing, and out of that nothing, we're gonna make something. And then the kind of valences and, and vibrations that take place when when something that was not comes into being is is what you know illuminates the imagination, which which moves us towards some sense of participation in this greatest, you know, this greater whole. Um, as far as Borges goes, it's an interesting question. But over the years, I always I hear a question that's say of a similar a similar family, um, and it's always a different author. You know, so it's, it's you know, people read, can read House of the Leaves and say Borges, correct. But they can also read, they can, they can hear Melville, correct. You know what I mean? There, there are so many kind of voices that infiltrate that text that no one's really, no one's wrong, but no one is also a completist. Um, and next time you see, uh, Mr. Hofstetter, give him, give him my regards. <laughs> yes. Um, in the passage you just read, Xanther talked about how she hadn't heard voices. And I was wondering if, out of all the voices that you created in your books, if any of them still stay with you. Like, for example, if you're writing today and you all of a sudden kind of hear Pelopino whispering in your ear in the background. Oh, that's such a good question. Um, Voices in my head. <laughs> 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 um, 
Uh, you're not the first to ask that question. But I'm committed, I promise you, I'm committed to the familiar. Uh, <laughs> you know, it's, the one thing about what I do is it, it takes such a long time. You know, it's, it's this tiny accretion of detail that slowly begins to, to, to build uh, a, you know, a scene, a setting, a character. And, and there is this moment in the very beginning where you are kind of willfully taking little spatters of ink or graphite or you know, electric dots and putting them onto the page and making something. And at that mo moment, it's, it is all voices, really. It's, it's a white noise, like different voices can, can enter you know, the scene, Borges can suddenly emerge, you know, Emily Dickinson's there, you know, the, 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 the guy who sells, um, who used to sell the newspapers on the corner. Um, but then slowly, if, if it happens, and it, it has to happen, like with all the characters of the familiar, this happened, they suddenly become their own. And it's a, for those of you who are, who are writers, I wish you this experience, and I hope you find this experience, and in fact, you should always find this experience if, if what you're doing is going to reach a, a point of completion, um, where it becomes of you, but no longer you. It becomes wholly invested in whatever you want to call it, its affect, its logic, its just beingness, that you are then under its sway. So, Pelafina will never talk through Xanther's head. Unless I invite her, actually. Right? That's, that would be different. Certainly Xanther is, 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 is a person capable of that. But Sam and Haley will only live as Sam and Haley. Jing Jing will only speak in, in his cadences. So they are of their own that it would, be, it would be so foreign. It would be like a violin suddenly sounding like a tuba. You know, it's possible but it takes so much work that it itself would be kind of a craft-driven thing. Um, but those characters still live in my head very um, fully, and it's, it's nice to, to see them emerge now and then. Say, no, 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 no. This, is, this is not your scene. <laughs> it's yeah. raining, you should talk about the rain. <laughs> it is raining, once again. Uh, so with the what did you what did you draw your inspiration on when you were these? What are you drawing on these? Was there an overlap to them? So I have a narrative about my work, and I'm not gonna say that this is the correct narrative, but it's the narrative that puts those books in place for me. Okay? And I'm gonna tell you what that narrative is. But before I tell you that narrative, I'm going to contradict myself right from the beginning. When I finished writing House of Leaves and when it came out, I really thought I understood House of Leaves. You know, I'm the author. I'm the guy that did it. Uh, I'm no longer sure really how the lightning got in the bottle. And I'm really not sure anymore what the lightning is. It just became of its own. And I realized that I simply had a narrative that made me feel in control of something that soon, is, that soon became beyond my control. But my narrative is as follows. I look at House of Leaves as a journeyman's piece. So I guess you would say I'm highly educated. And I took that education and in the classroom as well as in life and put it quite transparently, actually, into the book. So House of Leaves is very comprehensive in all, in all when it lists all of its, its influences. You can find all the authors that I was accessing at that point. And at that point, I was, you know, I was steeped in, in, the, in, the, in the academic philosophies of the 80s, you know, and all of that is apparent, whether we're talking about, you know, um, Derrida or Bloom, um, these 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 voices were 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 part of its construction, and out of it something else was emerging. 
But I was very much like someone who was working in an atelier, and I was studying under all of these greats, and I was able to put it into this book. From my perspective now, Only Revolutions is a masterwork. I'm not saying it's a masterpiece, but it's the work that did something that hasn't been done anywhere else. And people are only starting to get it. I mean, now people are writing books about it. Now it's like, it's that complicated. It's that, it embraces that much the sort of the, the three-dimensionality of the book, the question of image, even though it's not image apparent in some ways, the way it kind of constructs its rhyme schemes across various, you know, chiasmas of pages becomes a kind of a pictorial element as well as a musical element. And there is no handy academic theory that you can easily use to parse what that book is doing. So in that regard, I remain very proud of that book because it continues to kind of create a music as it twists along um, that you can't hear anywhere else. And it is of our culture and of our time. And that also gets back to the craft question of voice because there was an enormous amount of study that went into tracing those teenage vernacular words and seeing how they paired with the history that was going on. Um, so, following that along, the familiar for me then became this thing of like having embraced kind of my conscious education in House of Leaves and then embraced probably my conscious ambition, willfulness in Only Revolutions, you know, my, because there's a, there's a kind of, it's, it's aware of this, but there is this kind of ego-driven narcissism of like, I mean, it's, it's an ego trip, it's two ego trips, it's two kids on an ego trip that are so self-involved that they lay to waste the world around them. That I finally sort of kind of hit the bottom of myself and I realized this is it. I don't, I don't want to be that author. I don't want to be the author that lives in this tiny shack piecing together tiny bits of vocabulary that are ultimately stemming from his own ego. I want to really throw open the windows and the doors. And that's what I started to do. And it was weird, because as soon as I kind of found that intention, suddenly opportunities presented themselves. Eerily, actually, just the way I'm in this bar. And suddenly there was an invitation to perform the 50-year sword. Suddenly that meant that I had to hire actors, and we suddenly had a production, we had to design things. Suddenly I, the guy who was always by himself, is now having to deal with different personalities, most of whom were very unimpressed by who I was and why the hell was I telling them to stand there or using a conductor's rod or whatever it was. But it was this great kind of creaking apart of an idea of also how a novelist or a writer should look. The familiar then continues that. It, it begins to be about getting way outside of myself, going to Singapore, listening to what Singlish is, exposing myself to cultures that are way beyond me, to move away from that idea that the only thing that matters is kind of my memoir or my idea of myself, and I'm gonna add this little authentic piece to you know whatever is being written out there. Which, by the way, is legitimate. But for me, the journey was, okay, well, I'm not that interested in me. I'm really more interested in people outside of even books. I'm interested in hearing those vocabularies, those scenes, those, 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 those motions of feelings that can shape a culture, can shape a family, can shape a country, all of that. And for me, that didn't, that didn't even come, that didn't even begin at all on the page. That just began with a moment of saying, I'm gonna get outside. And so the influences really are the world at large. It's really sitting there talking to detectives. But also, you know, there's a textual part of it as well. So it's reading about what's going on in the LAPD, reading the Straight Times, you know, in, out of Singapore, listening to LA gang members and whatnot. And so building on this long tradition, which I think is evident in House of Leaves and Only Revolutions, and the 50-year sword is, is sort of investing myself in texts that are beyond me, that are completely strange, you know, and then and seeing where that leads. And from my perspective, at least, it feels like a good way to go. It feels like a good path to walk, you know? I can't, I can't vouch for what it will finally offer. This is certainly the beginning, but it personally has opened 
doors to new ways of thinking, to new ideas, and things that I wasn't particularly interested in at first, you know? It was like, you know, so, how's that for an unfinished question, answer to a great question? Yes. Uh, I guess. In your books, you talk a lot about things that are random. Um, and the sense of true randomness. And when I first learned about true randomness as opposed to what people think about randomness, it was by someone giving the example of raindrops. Uh, so when I started reading this about a raining day in May, <clears throat> I started to wonder if you thought that randomness was just a part of the human experience or if you were building upon the feeling in House of Leaves that there are things that just happen. Randomness, rain on the <laughs> roof. Um, well, randomness is complicated, right? What can seem random can turn out to be part of a very immense ordered mechanism that we just simply are incapable of perceiving. Um, I think some of the fun in House of Leaves is that some of the patterns that the characters can track, the reader can track. But I think as I get older, and that's another part of, you know, I'm going to answer a lot of questions as we keep moving forward, continue to answer them. But as you get older, you start to realize that there's a promise in literature when you're young that you'll be given answers, that, you'll, that, there, that, there, that you will find this thing that will organize the world ahead for you in a way that will grant you, if not complete control, at least a sense of, of safety. Um, but as you get older, you start to realize that that randomness may never be parsed. That randomness may never be organized into something that, that makes sense. And how do you deal with that? Because that randomness will stand inviolable before you, you know. And it's certainly an old problem. I mean, one only has to look to the book of Job to see, you know, what randomness can do to... to to life. Um, and I think that's kind of where we start in the familiar as well. It's how do we address that randomness in a way that doesn't reduce it to the point of creating a belief system that necessitates a war on another belief system about the same randomness, both sides claiming a certain authority over that randomness, willing to die for that authority over that randomness, when the randomness stays inviolate, you know, before both parties and the rain keeps thundering down. Yes? It always seems to me like the words are always trying to push their way off the page, like they're begging to interact with the universe. I guess I was wondering what draws you to putting them on the page as opposed to a work in some kind of electronic music. Yeah, what's, what's the deal with my words, and why am I not moving into a different medium? You know, I, I do love the book. I think it's, it's, it's something co as colossally ambiguous as just, I love the book and I keep returning to it. I mean, part of it's, you know, part of it's chance. Part of it is simply the fact that I fell in love with something, I continue to work in that field, and I continue to improve my understanding of that field, that practice. Um, and I understand how much work it takes to be good at something. So maybe if I was born now and I was coming into the world of, you know, of, 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 of I guess, electronic books, I might be drawn into that direction. But when we did the electronic book for The 50 Year Sword, which is really small, we had a few animations, we were exploring original music and whatnot, I realized it was a whole different job. I mean, I could spend a new lifetime studying what that was. And maybe I will decide at some point just to quit writing the books. I mean, maybe this book will just, you know, it won't get past volume four, and I will go into one of those, you know, those deep chasms, and I will emerge, you know, as a ceramics maker. Who knows? <laughs>
They come at the same time. The question is, do I see things? Yes, yes, definitely, vividly. And, um, and you know, I've had arguments with academics about this who claim that you really don't see anything when you read language, that language is its own special music, and that you just simply, you add on your own associations. And we have this kind of collective sense that we know that a family is living inside a house or a girl found a cat. But really our imaging of it is so radically different that it wouldn't even count as an image. I, I accept how that's possible and it makes sense, but I also feel that there is something, that there's a, to kind of create this polarity, this dialectic between image and text is false. I mean, I'm reading this amazing book by um, Eduardo Kohn, Kohn, K-O-H-N, called How Forests Think. And it's basically, it's a dense book, but he talks about the semiotics of the jungle and the forest and how, in fact, the forest as an ecosystem is actually talking, but we're just kind of deaf to its rhythms. Um, but when it comes, so, so there's always this kind of wrestling match with me. It's not just taking something and putting it on the page, you know? It's discovering what that something is by working on the page. And that can mean like pushing aside the words, bringing them back in, that can be about researching a voice, that can be about, you know, allowing randomness to take a, take a hold on what this whole process is. And it constantly changes. So over many years, for instance, I was still trying to de decide what font Xanther was going to be. And now and then, this is just an example, I would change the font, and that would actually change the word count on the page. And I suddenly realized, well, if it's far fewer words, that's going to change the way her voice is going to sound, you know? And so I allowed that kind of visual element to play. And then I was like, well, no, that's, she talks a little more rapidly than that, so I need kind of a different font. But the image then begins to start to take place, and it starts to fix who she is. And then her voice becomes very definite to me via her font, actually. So Luther's font is very much about fists, you know, there are these blocks of text, and it's kind of finding the right font, and kind of working with that. But I definitely have moved more and more in that direction, so I'm, I typeset as I go. And I was asked by the, the Guggenheim in New York to, to write a little 500 word thing on a vitrine from Matthew Barnum's Cream Master 2. And it became kind of complicated because they said, well, can you just send us the Word document? And we ended, I ended up shipping them like a 250 pound crate that was filled with this like huge piece that's, I guess it's about three feet by seven feet. And it's basically sort of furthering this idea, this exploration of, this, of what I call the signaconic. It's it, one of the primary images in Matthew Barney's movie is this upside down saddle. So it's a recreation of that saddle, but it's made entirely out of words that analyze what that saddle image is doing. But it looks like an old kind of Western poster. And uh, I don't know if they're going to hang it, but that's what they have. <laughs> <laughs> I didn't put a return address on it. Oh. Yes? Uh, much like the way absolutely the format has to be and bouncing around What do you mean? You mean like I mean, I actually know. never read or never commented on? The readers never actually stumbled upon because they bounce all around through you know, this maze of books. Like I said, that book is way out of my control. It's yes. having conversations that I don't know about anymore. So, uh -huh. you know, there's a came across a saying the other day, which is, I know what I have given you, but I don't know what you have received. So for me to speak upon, you know, on the behalf of what a what a what a reader has read or not read, I, I can't say. But I will promise you this. I can promise you that every reader who's read House of Leeds has created a room of their own in that vast house and discovered their own hallway that I didn't know was there. Yes. 
talk about your mundane habits, your writing habits? This isn't mundane enough? Words like parsing and random. <laughs> Take that word out of there. It's all about the mundane, actually. So, oh, man. So I, I get up pretty early. Get up about, it's either 5.10 or 5.20. I do yoga three times a week. I work out in the gym something or go hiking or do something. I come back, have some sort of power shake with good vegetables and, and it's whatever, proteins and chia seeds and everything that's so available in Los Angeles. Um, and then I go to my little word house, or other people would call it a word shack, or a word asylum. And I basically stay there for 10 hours writing. But with this project, which is a real wonder, it's, um, there is this informal atelier, which I say is, is not a cage, it's in a place of open windows and doors. And it means that there are other people who are working on certain graphic elements. There's you know, an enormous amount of time that went into this book. And so I have the luxury of taking off a couple of hours during the day and kind of checking in on those people that are, are working on certain designs. You know. And that's not every day, but it, it allows me to kind of have a moment to change gears and start talking about like, well, what is the color for Xanther and how are we, you know, even if we settle on pink, there are so many pinks and, you know, what is the black color and what is that and, and how does that line up with the various font choices and, how are we really going to do this owl? And you know, all the chapters have, have splash pages, so they're all designed. And how do we approach that? And the rainstorm itself was, you know, was just an incredible task. You know, there was an element of just slowly introducing, you know, how many raindrops, and then building this kind of visual symphony of all of these questions that would look like the rainstorm that's happening. And the mundane part is that, you know, the computers kept breaking down, you know. Every, even when we, we couldn't even output PDFs of it, you know, and everyone's like, it's just a PDF. No, it's, it's not a PDF. It's like almost a gig, and it just, everything would just overheat. And, and so, yeah, we got it done, but it was like, you know, those were the mundane things, and we were like, well, let's go online, and someone else had this, oh yeah, they had this problem. <laughs> rasterizes a vector, I don't know, let's try a different font. Are you doing this in Illustrator? Oh shit, you didn't import the, the right the right font. There's a font conflict, that's the problem, you know? And, and that, boy, that's tedious, you know, on that end. And then at the end, I'm pretty exhausted, but my girlfriend and I end up cooking a nice meal together and usually trying to kind of wind down. But the last couple of months, it was pretty much every single night would conclude with, or no, it would begin really with us raising a glass and going, Panic. <laughs> the book was so beyond me. It was, you know, I mean, to finish volume one and then to do it again and make sure it ships, which is slightly different in my case because when I say I'm shipping a book to, to Pantheon, it means it's finalized. It's going to the presses. It's not, a lot of writers have this experience where they get the galley, they make some corrections, they, you know, and they send it back, and then there's all this time off. For me, it was like, we are publishing this book. And in fact, if we'd used the old standard way of publishing a book, we never would have gotten it done. So at the end, Pantheon was copy editing, say, Luther's section, while I was finishing Anwar's section, and then I would send that off and start Jing Jing's section, and then I would be getting back you know, Xanther's section. And so all of these things were kind of rotating. Meanwhile, we're sending art, we're sending, making ink decisions, et cetera. So it's, it's pretty dull. I mean, it's, it's, it's a job. It's, it's, it's nonstop, and I love it. And I look out the window, and I talk to my squirrels, and, and they talk back. <laughs> the thing I decided on later, and not fans, let's just say readers. I'm more comfortable with readers. Um, 
the, it, was, it was a conscious decision. You know, I decided, I made a decision about my life. I didn't want to be this particular type of writer, which is kind of prescripted. You know, there's a kind of a, you know, a posture that one is supposed to take. And, you know, whether you're looking at Fitzgerald or Salinger or whoever the sort of the big ones were in certain decades, you know. And, I mean, I feel for women. I mean, Toni Morrison is, you know, certainly a light, but, you know, if Virginia Woolf is the one, you know, you're going with, it's like, you're just going to fill your pockets full of rocks. And of course, Hemingway wasn't too great up in Idaho either. So it's, you know, it's kind of, uh, and then more recent tragedies. But um, yeah, it was a decision to avoid that. It was a decision to say, like, you have to, how you live your life is how you write the books as well, you know? And that's why this book is particularly terrifying for me. Because Only Revolutions is a little like, I don't care if you like it or don't like it or understand it. Sam and Haley get it, and that's all that matters. And with the familiar, it is a lot about putting my faith in the future. Like, it is dependent on other people. I couldn't have done it without suddenly an artist who kind of wandered in and said, oh, I can draw flowers and just did a beautiful job, you know? Um, there's a, you know, there's, there, I depend on the people of Pantheon, I depend on readers, I depend on the intelligence of readers, you know? If everyone's just gonna be going thumbs up or thumbs down, you know, we're not gonna get past volume three. But if you wanna engage in the dialogue that this is about, and it is about a lot, then maybe there's gonna be a light to it, you know? The one adage I've always stuck by and I, I will never deviate is never underestimate the reader. So I will always believe that. And it's kind of funny because I always seem to get the same review. It's like the first review of House of Leeds was just unreadable, you know, and now, <laughs> only revolution, unreadable, you know, 50 year sword, unreadable. So I get, I guess I get used to it, but people are still reading them, so. <laughs> Twenty-seven. Parts. How did I imagine um, the familiar to be twenty-seven? Well, I'm not going to speak to exactly why the number, because the number is important. But what I will speak to is I, I began to understand over the years. I began to understand the pace of the story, you know, and I did finally make a decision that it would be more like The Wire, in that it was going to put character first before story and it wasn't going to be one of those pieces that just choose through action and events and all of that but that it would it would move slowly forward the way i feel that life works you know especially for us to understand the grandeur of life and all that it that it sort of portends across the not only the decades but generations we have to come we have to become at peace with also the slowness with which it kind of moves forward and you know, for me, it's it's not the Hollywood typhoon, a Hollywood, you know, uh, tsunami, which just sort of rises up, and then it's like, there's a picture of Laird Hamilton kind of like surfing down its face, and it's this, you know, amazing scene. It, it's more like those little clips that you might have seen of the, of the, of the Jap Japanese disaster, where it looks almost like a river. It just kind of comes forward, and then it just starts to push into the buildings, and suddenly the buildings are just kind of crumbling and it doesn't stop and it keeps moving. And in that, that's what I felt in this book. I felt like this little kitten was coming into, into, into my life in that way. It was inexorable. It was just, it was this creature that was so fragile and so pale beyond, the, beyond even the page, beyond even a limit of where it exists. And yet at the same time, I could feel this kind of gravity and density taking hold. And I, I just realized that it was just going to move into the future at its pace. And when I understood that, I realized it wasn't going to be three books or seven books, that it would be five books a season. And the fifth season, if we get there, it's, it's got a little something at the end. So I figure I can hold on to those extra two. Yes? Um, I heard you've gone uh, all these weekend, uh, yesterday, Sunday before. Uh, and River Rock has a new fantastic I do. I listen to the music that my characters are listening to. So it would be a very strange experience. You know, if you wandered by, you might hear like a duduk being played endlessly, and you'd know I was writing about the Armenian cab driver. 
or you hear Megan Trainer going on and on, and then you say, well, maybe he's just listening to her. <laughs> Um, but, you know, the various characters, like, listen to certain music. So I'm, I then, to get in kind of that mode, I return to some of the books that I know they're reading. So that's a big thing, too, about voice, is, like, understanding, like, they all have a certain sort of set of books and set of songs, and then I'll start listening to those, and that will put me sort of in a frame of mind, you know. So Bobby and Cass on the run definitely have listened to Pink Floyd more than once. And, uh... And, you know, it is kind of a, it's a strange experience because I do occasionally start to go, well, what do I like? You know, where, where am I in all of this? And I think that was one of the, one of the deals I made with myself, um, speaking to a lot of things that I've been covering tonight, is that I just, I said it, that wouldn't matter. And so one of the best compliments I ever got was when I found out a course was being taught on Faulkner, David Foster Wallace, and House of Leaves. I just didn't exist. <laughs> yes. So, um, you know, when you came together in your stories, in the course of the ending of your opera, I think you know, you're putting a lot of thought into how the page looks and what the readers experience and what the reader works. Um, so, my question is you know, I know some authors say it's very organic, I write the front and the back. And Story, some authors write back and forth, because they know the ending. In your case, it's has there kind of like, what is your process in terms of making that connection where, in the case of, let's say, a movie revolution, you're like, this is how it's going to be, these are the pieces at the end. Um, is it thought out at the beginning, or is it something where you're halfway through and you realize that these are the points of connection? Always a discovery. It's always a discovery. It's always, you know, I know exactly what's going to happen to Xanther in volume 25, without a doubt. Like, her her fate is determined. Everyone's fate in that book is completely determined. And I am also absolutely certain it will turn out nothing like that. <laughs> yeah. But I believe it, you know? I, 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 it, it's not that I'm, I'm not being really whimsical about it. It's, I, I think, you know, in some ways it comes a little from my, from my father. My father um, was in, you know, was in theater and, and, and cinema, he was in actor's studio, and he had a professional actor's workshop, and he was constantly working with actors. And one of the things you'll hear from professionals is the best way to free yourself is to really learn your lines. You know, you learn your lines, you know where your marks are, and at that moment, that's when you can bring light to the performance. That's when things can, can change. So for me, it's very important to know the lines of what's going on and knowing what my marks are, knowing what those beats are, but then at the same time, I'm constantly surprised. A chapter that I thought was going to end here ends there, and suddenly all sorts of things are changing. Um, and being open to that is really difficult, because when that happens, you know, well, it's a lot of work. <laughs> So I'm, I'm being told that uh, you're, you're to clear out right now. Is that what you're saying? Oh. No, no, take all the time you need. Uh, why don't we just say a couple more questions and then we'll get to some. Yes? How many cat shirts do you own? How many cats do I own? Right now, none. Oh, cat shirts. Uh, quite a few. <laughs> yes? OK, so related to the cat shirt question yes. and some of the other questions about how the book is organized, I remember watching it. You just, you know the answer to that question. You just want to hear me say it. <laughs> you know, I mean, duh. <laughs> that's, that's the title for tonight. Duh. All right, let's sign some books. It was nice coming here. Thank you very much. Thank you, everyone. Thank you so much. We are going to have Mark sign books at the table in the back right, my right, over here. And so we're going to let Mark through, and then you can form an orderly line and uh, get some books signed. Thank you.